I won't bore you with my small talk then. Um, just you know, glad to see some uh, people online joining us today, so, which is great. Um, and like Elaine said, I'm here from the Share Wellbeing team, and I'm here to talk to you about stress and anxiety at university, um, which unfortunately probably will be quite a timely topic for you um, right now with a lot of submission deadlines coming up. Um, exams are just around the corner, so I know a lot of students are feeling the stress and the anxiety. Um, so hopefully we'll share some tips on how to cope with that. Um, we'll also talk about the difference between stress and anxiety um, and when does it become an issue. Um, and finally we'll finish with information on services within the university, external services and links to self-help resources. So what is stress? So stress is simply put, uh, the body's reaction to feeling threatened or under pressure. It's, it's very, very common. Our bodies are really good at reacting to stress. And it can be beneficial. It can be motivating. It can help us achieve things in our life and meet our demands. But as I'm sure many of you will know, too much stress can affect our mood, our, our body, and our relationships. And um, really important, again, I think many of you will be aware of this as well, is if we experience stress over a long period of time, this can lead to feeling uh, burnout and you know, other mental health uh, issues. So here's a little curve, or the year just doesn't curve, to kind of illustrate how stress can be beneficial, but also to what stress can be detrimental to our performance. So if we're thinking about, thinking about studying, it, sometimes it can be really hard to get ourselves motivated if our stress level is really low. We might be feeling bored or kind of apathetic. We know we've got things coming up, but maybe not feeling too, but too and motivated. I know myself from my student days, it was hard for me to get myself motivated until maybe a good few weeks before the, the deadline. In, I know a lot of students do this, you know, they, they leave things to the last minute because they feel like they need that kind of motivation behind them. And there is kind of an optimal level of stress that you know, allows you to sort of perform the highest quality. So there's, this is kind of a very general version of the curve. This kind of differs between the easy tasks and difficult tasks. So the stress level is actually probably a little bit lower to achieve optimal level of performance for difficult tasks. But stress level should be a little bit higher for easy tasks. So if, Otherwise, you might feel a bit bored. So that's kind of an interesting thing. Um, so like I mentioned, a lot of students will leave things until maybe closer to the deadline, thinking, OK, that'll give me my motivation. And that can be fine. Sometimes that does work. But where students and you know, people in general run into issues is when we're trying to balance multiple demands at the same time. So it's rare these days that we have a student who is just a student most of our students are working, they might have caring responsibilities, they have children, they have, you know, many different competing demands of their time. And all of these different things bring unpredictability into the equation. So if you leave your things to the last moment, and something else pops up in one of the other areas in your life that can get in the way. Another sort of thing I want to mention about the stress curve is that the stress curve can vary between individuals. So you might know people who get really stressed they very quickly and this affects them. Other people can seemingly deal with lots of stressful situations and still function really well. Um, like one of the examples is kind of an SAS soldier who would function extremely well in high anxiety, high stress situations that many of us would find extremely uh, difficult to cope with and we would not be able to perform in any way. And they might find low stress situations extremely boring. Um, so, like I said, this kind of does vary between person to person. And I think the most important thing is knowing where you are kind of on this curve. Try to reflect, you know, what do you feel motivated, what works for you, so you're not feeling too stressed and being done too bored. So related to that is the stress bucket analogy. So like I said, we all have a different level of sort of ability to deal with stress, to cope with stress. And that can be illustrated by the stress bucket. So you can think about it as having a different size of a stress bucket. So someone might have a very small stress bucket where you know, just a few stressful things can lead to kind of stress overflowing, people becoming overwhelmed, whereas other people might seemingly 
have this kind of endless stress bucket. They deal with multiple demands, stresses in their life, and and they're coping really, really well. So the, the size of the bucket, again, it varies between the individuals, and it, it, it really depends on our genes, our personality, our life experiences. So it's that thing, you know, like if you feel like you can't cope with stress very, very well, I wouldn't like, blame yourself. Um, it, it can have a lot to do with just kind of how you're born, your genes, like I said, your personality. Uh, but of course, there are things that you can do, which, which we'll talk about to kind of help you cope with the stresses. So here I put just some like things that can contribute to increased stress levels. So things that are maybe more likely for university students, like issues with flatmates. Um, like right now, I was reading recently how um, students are finding it difficult to deal with the cost of living crisis. Where, you know, people, maybe some people are not as um, you know, mindful of turning the lights off, and that can lead to uh, disagreements. Or you know, financial worries, again, that's a huge one right now. Uh, sleep, so students are not known for their great sleep, but it's so important. Um, people might have health worries. Obviously, exams and submissions contribute to this. Um, so, what do we do? How do we, how do we cope with these stresses? How, how do we, you know, re reduce the sort of stress levels for our own personal stress buckets? So, that's when we, we uh, talk about healthy coping skills. So, this is, these are different mechanisms that are available to us to help us decrease the stress levels and therefore allow us to cope in better. In, and more issues there. So things that can help us cope with stress are things like making sure you take some relaxation time. So you know sometimes when it's like submission time, exam time, you feel like you need to be studying all the time because if any moment you're not studying, you feel like you're wasting. But actually, there's kind of a diminished return. To studying, you know, if, if you're studying constantly, if you're studying more than 35, 40 hours a week, actually every hour after that, it, you're more likely to make mistakes. Um, so that you know, there's kind of a, a trade-off, I would say. So make sure you are building in relaxation time, um, making sure you're you know, you're talking to others if you're feeling stressed. Take time to enjoy your hobbies. Again, it's it's really hard to keep going. A high level of performance when you are not taking any time for yourself or doing anything that you're enjoying. Other things that help with our stress is planning ahead. So if you know, which most of you will know, you've got a stressful period coming up, you know, multiple submissions at the same time, exam periods, etc. What can you do to decrease your stress during that time? How can you plan ahead? And it doesn't have to be anything elaborate. Can be something as simple as planning your outfit the night before that like, you know you have your exams. So that's one last thing to worry or stress about, or making a lunch. Um, again, exam submissions are something that contributes to our stress. So completing tasks, that's one thing. If you can identify what is causing you the stress, and if you can get rid of that thing or decrease it, that will really, really help. Exercise and um, Everyone knows it's really beneficial and it really helps us clear our heads and get cope and, and get focus and deal with things. And these healthy coping skills are like taps. They help drain the water, as you can see here. Using the healthy mechanism, the water goes down so we can again cope with these different stresses. And life is unpredictable, so I think what I would suggest is you know, try to keep your stress level at a manageable level because things can come up. What happens though very often is um, when we are not um, coping with our stress um, in a healthy way, we, we start um, drinking, maybe using drugs, um, ignoring our problems, over under eating, procrastination. So, all of these things you know, are, are things people do to cope with stress, but these are what I would call a kind of false tap. So, you might feel temporarily. You feel some temporary relief from the stress, but actually what ends up happening is that it, it doesn't really release that water, it all goes back, and you're feeling more stressed afterwards. So one of the unhealthy coping skills that we're talking about here is procrastination. So I thought I would 
maybe go into a little bit more depth in, about that particular topic, because I think that could be quite a timely one at this time of the year. So just to show you, unhealthy coping increases your stress. So what do we mean by procrastination? So that's basically when we make a decision for no valid reason to delay or not complete a task or a goal we've committed to instead of doing something instead and instead of doing something of lesser importance despite there being negative consequences to not following through on the original task or goal. So just delaying something, not completing your task or goal, and there's not really a good, a good reason for it. And we normally tend to go and do something less important. So on the next slide, we'll talk about kind of what, what happens and how do we procrastinate. So, um, you know, what do we procrastinate about? So obviously studying is a huge one for students. Um, I know that, um, you know, kind of starting coursework can be a huge barrier sometimes. Um, maybe health is a huge thing people procrastinate about as well. You know, I'll start working out tomorrow or I'll start healthy tomorrow. And financial things are like, something that people can procrastinate about quite a lot. So open, like opening bills, paying bills, budgeting, you say, oh, I'll start budgeting, I'll start thinking about my future tomorrow. Even things like, you know, things that normally we enjoy, social relationships. I'll text that person back tomorrow, I'll call them back later. So we, we can procrastinate on a million different things. And how do we procrastinate? So we might procrastinate by doing things that we find more fun, so pleasurable activities like watching TV, playing computer games, and going on social media, really common. Lower priority tasks, so it, it could be like cleaning your flat, for example. I know students say that their, their okay, house has never been cleaner than when they've had an exam okay, to study for or, or coursework to, to complete. Uh, we might procrastinate by socializing or just distractions like your phone. So what are some of the sort of common assumptions or rules that we tell ourselves that lead to uh, procrastination? I'm not going to go over all of these because as you can see there's quite a few of them, but I'll maybe go over the, the more common ones. So the first one here you see motivation. Motivation is such a classic one where um, you know, people just very common way to procrastinate where people say, I'll do an assignment when I'm in the mood, when I'm in the zone. I really feel like doing it right now, but I think if I'm feeling a bit more motivated for it, I'll do it. But do you really think that you're ever going to be in the mood to do the task you might find difficult or boring? Probably not. So people who are successful in completing things know that motivation doesn't come from nowhere. It doesn't come first. Action comes first. So it goes action, motivation, or action. So that's how you get over that common assumption. Another one that's quite common is the mastery model. I have to get it right the first time. Or you know, you might compare yourself to others and say, other students on my course find this really easy. I'm really struggling. I might not be good enough. You know, find this stressful. And, and that's really unrealistic. We don't know what other people are going through. There's a likelihood that everyone is finding this a little bit difficult. And the, the kind of idea behind this is that successful people assume that tasks will be difficult or frustrating. So you come in with it expecting that it might be a bit of a challenge and that help you, helps you cope with that and rather than saying, oh, if I, if I can get it at the first try, I'm just never going to get it. Perfectionism is a huge, huge one. A lot of us grow up in families where um, there, there are huge expectations on us. You, you need to do things perfectly or it's not right um, or it's not worth doing. So we put so much pressure, pressure on ourselves. So in contrast, when we lower our standards just a bit, it can relieve some of that pressure. So for example, when you're feeling like, oh, I, I can't, I, I'm not, you know, going back to the motivation, I'm not in the zone. I can't get this perfectly right right now. I'm not going to do it. That's actually just, you know, again, putting things off. So it's, instead of doing that, you can say, well, I'll get started. I'll make a draft. You know, call it a draft, and I'll try to perfect it later. 
but you know, doing something again, putting that action that will lead to motivation. So there's other ones here, but I, I'm not going to go over all of these today, just in, in, in the just think about the time that we have. So thinking about what you can actually do about uh, these different uh, beliefs or rules that we give ourselves. So you can think about doing a pros and cons list, advantages and disadvantages of procrastinating, and also the advantages and disadvantages of starting the task today. Um, another one is to make a plan and really think about what it is, you know, what the problems are, what are the things that you do to procrastinate, what is likely, what can derail you, and, and make a plan. For example, I like to study on my bed, but then I fall asleep. Well, if this always happens, I will study at my desk or at the library, so it can be quite simple. You know, it doesn't have to be anything life-changing, but you know, it's really considering how you study, how you procrastinate, and try to make a plan to uh, go around that. Make the task easy, so back to procrastination, uh, about perfectionism. If we're adequate rather than perfect, make sure your expectations are realistic. You can make things adequate and then perfect them, but then just try to aim for perfection from the start. Make a list of priorities, this is the classic sort of time management skill. Think about you know, all the different things you have to do. It's easy to get overwhelmed, but if you prioritize and then commit to a time frame that you help. Make sure you give yourself credit for what you do. So don't just focus on what you haven't done. Think about what you have done already and give yourself a pat on the back. Another time management strategy is to break the task down to so break it into smaller parts and give yourself 20 minutes or so to start on that part. You might have heard about the Pomodoro technique, which is if you Google kind of Pomodoro timer, it's the idea that you do chunks of 20 minutes broken down by five minute breaks. You do four of those and then you take a longer break of like I think 40 minutes and then you go back to it. So it, 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 it puts those it breaks into your work and it helps us concentrate. The final one is take distractions away. So for example, if you find that your phone is really distracting, put it in a different room, give it to your flatmate or your parent and say, don't give this to me until in, you know I've been studying for an hour. And that can be really, really helpful. So that was kind of the, the bit about stress and coping with stress, procrastination. So now what we're going to talk about is anxiety. So this is when stress gets uh, kind of on top of us and becomes really severe or there seems to be no reason for it that we can cast it as anxiety. So again, it is a body's way of responding to danger and it works really, really well. But often it kicks in when it's not needed, when the danger is in our minds, when it's in reality. And that's enough to trigger that system. So, how does anxiety affect us? So, there's sort of three different ways that anxiety can impact on us, and they all interlink. So, for example, your sympathetic nervous system switches on when you're feeling anxious. Is that fight, fight or flight? A reaction where you feel your heart thumping, you might feel a bit breathless, which can lead to dizziness, you might feel some muscular tension. Stress anxiety has a huge impact on our stomach. You might be sweating, trembling, you might need to visit the toilet more often. So it's got this real physical element. And I've met students before who've experienced such high levels of anxiety that they thought that they were having a heart attack. They actually went to a and E to get checked out, and it was nothing but anxiety, but it was such a physical reaction. So it affects us physically, but also affects us mentally. It affects how we think. So we start worrying. We start thinking, what if? What if the shops are too busy? What if it's too crowded? I can't go. What if maybe you're having anxiety about social situations? What if I meet someone I can't think of anything to say? What if I faint? So this one is linked to the physical symptoms of anxiety. Sometimes what happens is when people are feeling quite a lot of physical symptoms, 
they start to have anxiety about the symptoms themselves. So these kind of physical symptoms, the thinking, can affect then how we behave. So we might start avoiding situations that are difficult. So anxiety is really, really, really common. Avoidance is a common behavior associated with anxiety. But that can lead to isolation and loneliness. You, you end up kind of, you know, the, the situation becomes bigger and more scary in your mind if you avoid it. And so yeah, avoiding things is, is one kind of common behavioral uh, response. It might also affect how um, irritable we are. Uh, we might feel agitated, feel overwhelmed. There might be a low mood and sense of hopelessness uh, associated with it. And also you might Know a person like this who's really, really anxious and they're just doing everything at full speed, unable to slow down constantly on the go. So it's kind of another sort of flip side of anxiety sometimes. So how does anxiety become a problem? So when do people experience these sort of unpleasant and panicky feelings? And they become more aware of the physical symptoms of anxiety. And people can become very sensitive to these. You know, the slightest change in your breathing eh, or heartbeat can, can start making you feel like, oh, something's wrong. You, know, you feel alarmed. And that in turn makes things worse. And you become afraid of the symptoms themselves. Another way anxiety becomes more of a problem is by association. So for example, if you, for example, had one um, class where you felt really anxious, perhaps the lecture was quite challenging, they ask questions out of the blue, really challenging questions put people on the spot, and you developed anxiety around that class. You can sometimes transfer to another class, even though there's you know the lecture there is being you know, a lot more pleasant, and you don't have the same sort of fears, but it's, it transfers and it becomes that you start feeling anxious about all your classes. The final way is by anticipation, is that if you experience anxiety in some of these situations, like I mentioned here, you might begin to feel anxious even before you go into that situation. And that, that anticipation can then lead to avoidance. So why don't these problems go away? It's kind of interesting, it's, it, it tends not to go away by itself because it has become a habit, so we're used to avoid the things that you know will be difficult that will be difficult you're used to being intense you're rather be intense or you're used to kind of react in an anxious way to all kinds of situations so it becomes kind of a way of being and habits are really difficult to break you have to really work hard and break these but you know that, that can be improved what are some other things that can make anxiety worse so being under stress and pressure experience major changes in your life, you know, so like moving house or you know, experiencing a death in the family. You know, caffeine is a huge one. So if you're recognizing some of the physical symptoms of anxiety I discussed earlier, have a review of how much uh, caffeine you drink, because that might be a huge contributor that you're not even realizing. Alcohol and drugs, even a slight hangover can impact our anxiety and make it worse. If you're not eating regularly, you're not eating enough. And again, sleep is so important, it's so foundational. If you're not sleeping well, you're not going to be functioning well, you're not going to be feeling well. So what can we do to respond to these uh, symptoms of stress and anxiety? So as I mentioned, anxiety can affect the way we think. So here are some really helpful questions to start challenging those thoughts. So like the top one is, I'm looking at the whole picture. I love the second one. I, can I predict the future here? Is it helpful to try? What is more helpful? Yeah, you can't predict the future. If you could predict the future, you wouldn't be here. You would be sitting on an island somewhere because you would know exactly what's going to happen. So you would have to be studying. Are there any strengths or positives in me or the situation that I might be ignoring? It is likely that you've been stressed before. So what have you done previously that has worked for you? How did you get through that? What are some of the strengths that you bring to this situation? Also, remind, just reminding yourself this feeling will pass. 
this is normal body reactions. So again, we need to think more about the physical symptoms because people can get so overwhelmed by these. This, this, this will pass and breathe because you're touching on the breathing. Just regular self care is really, really important because it regulates our nervous system and decreases that kind of physical reaction. So, making sure you're getting enough sleep, doing things like yoga. And here are some ideas of maybe things you can do when you're going into a stressful situation. I know that you, know, you mentioned that a lot of students are quite anxious about exams and not that having had one in person, perhaps ever. So what can you do to make that situation a little bit more pleasant for you um, or you kind of calm yourself down? So sensory stimulation is really, really good when it comes to anxiety. And people can often feel like they're kind of having an out-of-body experience with anxiety. So how to you bring yourself down? So you can bring yourself down through your favorite smells. So for example, if you like the smell of lavender or citrus, you can kind of on your wrist and smell that um, as you take your exam to, to kind of bring it up to the kind of present moment. Think about textures, you know, maybe you have like a favorite hoodie you wear that makes you feel really comfy and feel safe. Maybe wear that. Say so a sense of touch, sounds, images, you know, thinking about things that make you happy. Having a grounding object, so uh, some people might have like a little lucky token or something that they have on them. And even touching that thing can be um, quite reassuring. Keeping a diary of your feelings and things that trigger stress. And we talked to both of us about how you're feeling. So that was just kind of a general overview about stress and anxiety. If you're finding that, if you're identifying a little bit more of the anxiety and maybe it's affecting your life to a higher degree, it might be an idea to get in touch with the in student well-being teams, we've got support through the disability service, so that's for individuals who have long-term conditions with disabilities. We've got the counseling service, so each student is eligible for six counseling sessions each academic term, so that's a space where you can talk about your difficulties in a confidential manner. We've got mental health advisors that can support you with mental health issues and help you develop big skills and identify them. And then you also have me as a student well-being advisor. I'm here to uh, advise you about any general well-being issues, welfare concerns, and I can also talk to you specifically about being a student care if that's uh, something related to you, and support LGBT plus students. There's also other university support systems, and I would say if you are struggling, speak to your personal tutor. If staff don't know you're struggling, they can't help. Um, I will share this PowerPoint later so you can click through these resources later as well. And there's some external resources. So I, I do hope you found this presentation helpful. And if you have any further questions, feel, feel free to contact me. Thank you.